Good morning, honorable members, and those under the sound of my voice. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Today in our Moments of Impact devotional segment, our topic is, Bake Me a Cake First. There's a story recorded in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 to 15, where God instructs the prophet Elijah to leave the brook Cherith and go to a place called Zarephath to meet a widow woman there who has been commanded to sustain him. Elijah obeys the instructions of God to go to Zarephath. Upon arriving at Zarephath, he came to the gate of the city, and there was a widow woman there gathering sticks. And he called to her, and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now she was going to fetch it. He called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, and go and do as thou hast said, but make me a cake first, and bring it to me, and afterwards make one for you and for your son. For thus said the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord sent it rain upon the earth. The story with this widow woman and Elijah is yet another story that touts the message that the God we serve is a God who performs miracles. As we read just a moment ago, the widow woman was on her last. She was gathering two sticks to prepare her last meal for her and her son. She had already accepted her fate that she had come to the end of her life. But God sent the prophet to Zarephath to this widow to challenge her because he wanted her to experience a miracle. The prophet made a request of her to bring him some water. While she was bringing some water, he said, also bring me a cake. The woman had no problem fetching some water for him, but the request for the cake was a little over the top. She responded, I only have enough food to supply me and my son to eat and then we will die. In other words, I don't have enough to feed you, me, and my son. The prophet responded to her, Fear not, go and do as thou said, but bake me a cake first. Bring it to me, and afterwards make one for you and your son. And if you do this, the barrel of meal shall not waste, nor the cruise of oil fail till the Lord sends rain upon the earth. From face value, it would appear as though the prophet was being very harsh and trying to take away from this widow the little that she had. What the prophet was trying to do, though, when he told her to bake him a cake first, was to position her for a miraculous supply of flour and oil. The prophet wanted this widow to understand the importance of putting God first in her life. The widow, though reluctant, obeyed the prophet, and because of our obedience to bake him a cake first, her, her son, and the prophet did eat many days. In conclusion, I want to encourage each of you under the sound of my voice to put God first. God doesn't want to be second fiddle in your life, and if you put him first, you can expect to experience his miraculous power in your life. I leave you with these words today, from God's mouth to your ears, bake me a cake first. Selah, think and act on these things. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for your faithfulness and your loving kindness toward us. We thank you for your presence in our lives. Father, today we boldly come to your throne of grace to find help in the time of need. Oh Lord, we need you more now than ever before in our nation. Help us, oh God, to put you first in our lives. Help us to never allow anything or anyone to take your place. Father, we boldly declare today that you have preeminence in our lives. 
Now, Father, we ask that you would saturate this house with your presence. We lift up these honorable members today as they have gathered to discuss the business of our nation. We pray that you would grant them wisdom, intel, and direction as they seek to navigate us through these very unique times. Oh, Lord, we need a shift to take place in our nation. Shift us, O oh Lord, for your honor and for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us repeat the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, honorable members. In the house with us today, we have visitors from our second city, and we'd like to welcome them. They are the women who make up the women's branch of the Progressive Liberal Party, and we'd like to welcome you to our gallery today. Today is also a special day in our country. It's the day that we celebrate the birth of our father of the nation, Sir Lyndon Oscar Pinling, and I want to wish him a heavenly happy birthday. But celebrating along with him is our sergeant at arms who keeps us protected at the door. So on your way, members, make sure to wish him a happy birthday. He is also a special baby. And in our gallery today, I have my constituent and my good friend, Mighty Kulmer, who is also celebrating his birthday. Happy birthday. Monka, 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 Monka. So happy birthday to you, my love. I'm sorry I'm missing your name out. Yes. Wallace Whitfield, the founder of the Free National Movement. Yes. Happy birthday, happy, happy birthday yes. to him. So we have many. <laughs> <laughs> Chair recognizes West Grand Bahama and Bimini. My, my, my own speaker, I'm being reminded by Cat Island uh, that uh, successor Walls Whitfield was, in fact, the chairman of the Progressive Liberal Party. In and led the PLP to victory in 1967. <laughs> so he has bell wishes coming from both sides. <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, we were intending to debate this morning the central bank bill. Yes. Uh, the member for Cat Island has informed that the member and official leader of the opposition had requested some information relevant. Uh, the information has not been passed on to the member for Marco at this time. So therefore, we've delayed that debate to debate the arbitration bill as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. <clears throat> Marco City, that's fine. Yes. At the, at the, when we suspended, Honorable Members, we were at statement of communication by ministers. Are there any further communications? Yes. The, the, the chair, yes, sir. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Exuma and Ragged Island. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. May I also take uh, your permission to welcome the magnificent ladies from Grand Bahama. 
uh, to the House of Assembly today. Uh, but Madam Speaker, I rise with your leave to apprise this honorable house of recent developments with respect to the Bahamas overflight fees, which have been reported in the local dailies and commented on by me as the minister responsible for aviation. Before presenting a summary of the disputes that have recently surfaced, permit me to first give some background to the Bahamas fee charging scheme that was implemented in May 2021 and marked the point at which the Bahamas regained uh, oversight of its airspace. The process leading up to this transition was fully aligned with the ICAO principles of consultation and transparency. On October 31st, 2020, the Bahamas published a notice of intent which outlined the charging system, including the methodology and cost components. This was followed by extended consultation with the airspace users and other industry stakeholders, and the process culminated with the Bahamas publishing the notice of imposition on December 22, 2020, which advised the commercial airlines of the user charges, including overflight fees. Madam Speaker, also notable is that the composition of the Bahamas fee charging scheme, as outlined in the notice of imp imposition, is comprised of three components. One, overflight fees. Two, origin destination fees. And three, passenger levy fees. The overflight fees, which are charged to all commercial airlines flying over the Bahamian airspace, ranges from $8.5 to 51.6 per 100 nautical miles based on the aircraft's maximum takeoff weight. The origin destination fees are charged on flights originating from or landing in the Bahamas and range from $10 to $61 per flight based on aircraft maximum takeoff weight. The passenger levy fee of $1 per passenger is applied to all commercial airlines originating or terminating in the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, I want to emphasize that these documents that I will lay today are all in the public domain, as they were published by the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas on its website in compliance with the ICAO principles of transparency. It is also important to recall that the Bahamas executed several key agreements to underpin this new charging scheme. In January 2020, the Bahamas and the United States enter in, entered into the Air Transport Agreement, ADA, which contained inter alia provisions relating to the charging of fees by each government and dispute resolution. In April 2021, an Air Navigation Services Agreement was signed with the US FAA, under which the FAA agreed to continue to deliver air navigation services in respect of approximately 75% of the Bahamas' upper airspace at no cost. Instead, the FAA elected to charge an annual fixed administration fee of $80,000 to cover the provision of aircraft track data used by the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority, BANSA, to provide billing invoices. Importantly, the execution of this sourcing of air navigation services, ANS, to the U.S. recognizes the Bahamas' current inability to provide these services and the expressed intent to build capacity over the coming years to enable it to provide these services directly. I might also add that ANS for the other 25% of the airspace is currently being provided by ECNA, that is the Cuban ANS provider, and that the government is advancing negotiations to formalize a similar outsourcing agreement with this provider. The third key agreement was executed in July 2021 with the International Air Transport Association, IATA, to provide collection services for the new aviation fees. Before I get into the actual fee dispute matters, it is also important to provide honorable members with a perspective of the fiscal aspects of the fee charging scheme. For 2021-2023, tw sorry, 2022-2023, Airspace fees under the scheme were estimated at $42.92 million, although expected to be higher based on the faster than expected recovery in air traffic movements. Between May 
2021 and November 2022, fees invoiced under the airspace scheme total 49.69 million, of which 44.69 represented overflight fees, 4.4 million origin, origin, origin and destination fees, and 1.3 million was for the passenger levy. Total fees collected through November 2022 is 42.6 million, with receivables at 6.4 million. Banza and CARB, Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas, share the overflight fees and the origin destination fees with the passenger levy going directly to CARB. So having framed this background, Madam Speaker, I will now turn to provide honorable members with a summary of the actual disputes that have arisen on the fee charging scheme, and in particular, the overflight fees. And I say summary because, as is normal, the case with matters of dispute, these are very detailed submissions by all parties to ensure that their respective positions are well established and supported. And when I say summary, Madam Speaker, I wish this communication could be shorter. Uh, but given the technical nature of this, uh, I believe I'm about halfway through. Prior to the latest matters between the US Department of Transportation, the Bahamas' provider of air navigation services, Banza, was confronted with challenges to the Bahamas' airspace charging scheme. In fact, shortly after the fee charging scheme's first year anniversary, the Bahamas was invited to a follow-up meeting in June 2022 by IATA in Miami to provide its members with an update on the new charging scheme. It was during this meeting that, uh, that the IATA members expressed strong concern over what they called the Bahamas charging scheme, basically characterizing it as prohibitive, with no new or incremental services provided for the additional costs imposed, and that the cost, the cross-subsidization of lower airspace operations by the overflight fees was at variance with the ICAO cross-relatedness principle. In subsequent rounds of exchanges between the Bahamas and IATA, which also included a meeting between IATA's regional vice president for the Americas and my office in Nassau, these points of contention were strongly objected to by the Bahamas. However, on November 29, 2022, the Bahamas was advised by the IATA clearinghouse where the bulk of the airline payments are cleared that American Airlines lodged a formal protest on its payments for the last six months, June to November 2022, mm -hmm. which totaled $4.2 million. Following the rules of the ICH, Bansa presented a formal response on December 8, 2022 justifying the validity of the Bahamas' fee charging scheme and how it was considered to be consistent with ICAO principles. Madam Speaker, on December 15, 2022, the Bahamas was advised that having reviewed the position of American Airlines and the Bahamas, it concluded that a substantive dispute existed between the parties. Under the rules, therefore, the IAH notified that the $4.2 million in dispute would be held in escrow until the matter is resolved. Before any consultations could be pursued on this front, the dispute with the airlines took a parallel track when on December 19, 2022, the members of the Air Transport Association of America, Airlines for America, filed a joint complaint with the U.S. Department of Transportation under the International Air Transportation Fair Competitive Practices Act against the Bahamas and a number of the Bahamas air carriers into the USA. In summary, Airlines for America alleged that Banza charges for air navigation services exceeded the cost to the Bahamas of providing those services and deemed the charges to be unjustifiable, unreasonably discriminatory, anti-competitive, and inconsistent with the Bahamas' obligation under Article 10 of the US Bahamas ARA, which promotes that user charges imposed on carriers be cost-based. In this submission, Airlines for America asks that unless the Bahamas ends the collection of what it characterizes as unjust, unjust and discriminatory user charges, that the authority held by air carriers of the Bahamas to provide international air transportation to the U.S. be curtailed or suspended or be subject to other 
countervailing measures as the Department of Transportation finds to be in the public interest. Subsequent to Air Airlines for America's filing, the Department of Transportation issued an order on December 21, 2022, instituting proceedings against the U.S. Bahamas ARA and inviting interested parties response to the complaint within 21 days. As honorable members would agree, this acceleration in dispute presented huge consequences for the stability of funding our air navigation services and the continuity of operations of our domestic carriers into the US. Therefore, given the gravity of this matter, the government engaged external counsel, the US law firm of Becker, to assist with preparation of the Bahamas' mm -hmm. response to the joint complaint of Airlines for America to the Department of Transportation. I can report that on January 11, 2023, the Bahamas' comprehensive response was filed, calling for the dismissal of the joint complaint on several key grounds. One, that the DOT, Department of Transportation, does not have jurisdiction, <clears throat> given that it can only rule on a case of discrimination under the ARA, and noting that the charges being levied by Airlines for America covered other structural elements of the fee scheme that went beyond the ARA. Two, that Airlines for America does not have standing to challenge the airspace charges. Three, that the DOT is not the proper forum for resolving the dispute. And four, the Bahamas overflight fees are consistent with the governing agreements and identical for all airlines using Bahamas airspace. Members would note that the Bahamas also had the opportunity to file a reply which is a further reply to the subsequent response of, of Airlines for America to the Bahamas, initial responses to the complaint. Basically, the Bahamas reinforced its argument that the Airlines for America must prove that there is discrimination in the Bahamas' fee rather than allegations about the unjustifiable practices. The Bahamas' argument clearly articulated that all airlines, including Bahamian air carriers, pay identical charges when flying over the Bahamian airspace, and that all arguments by Airlines for America, the charges do not align with the costs, are not within the scope of ARA, and do not form the basis of the discrimination charge. Prior to the final ruling by DOT, the government initiated discussions with the US government via the diplomatic channel, and had two very productive sessions with the DOT, one of which was on prepared responses by the Bahamas to questions raised by the DOT in its consideration of the complaint. We are pleased to note, Madam Speaker, that on February 21st, 2023, the US DOT issued an order denying the complaint against the Bahamas, indicating that it cannot conclude that the Bahamas fee structure constitutes unjustifiable or unreasonable discrimination. However, the DOT has expressed its intent to pursue its cost-based concerns under the terms established in the U.S. Bahamas agreements, which the government agrees is the appropriate forum for these discussions and consultations. In concluding, let me reassure this honorable house that the government remains committed to achieving a successful and complete resolution of all continuing concerns with the cost-based analysis for our over, overflight fees. We are keen to protect the Bahamas' sovereign right to recovery, uh, to recover the level of fees necessary to provide air navigational services to our airspace users, which should include building out both the human and infrastructure capital necessary to eventually take control of the management of our airspace. Our intention is also to ensure that the Bahamas' fee charging scheme is compliant with ICAO principles. We have already received a formal request from the US DOT to commence formal consultations under Article 13 of the US Bahamas ARA. Our intention is to move quickly to formalize consultations along these diplomatic channels to reach a satisfactory conclusion to these issues at the earliest possible date. In fact, the first meeting is already scheduled to be held mid-April. 
Madam Speaker, as I wrap up, I mentioned earlier the complaint submissions by Airlines for America and the Bahamas' response to these are quite lengthy as they lay out both parties' positions in considerable detail. However, this is an issue of critical national importance. The arguments of these submissions are well presented in the DOT's order instituting proceedings an order denying complaint, both of which are public documents and which I now table as a part of my presentation on this matter. And I will spare you, Madam Speaker, I won't read it in its entirety. <laughs> but I now lay these documents on the table. Thank you very much. Madam. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the documents be brought out. Order that the documents to lie on the table. Further statement and communication? The chair recognizes the honorable member for Tall Pines. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I also would like to uh, commend the Deputy Prime Minister for an extensive communication that clarified a lot of things that was in the public domain. And to join him and you in welcoming uh, these wonderful ladies from Grand Bahama who I've had the opportunity to work with for many years, and they are still going strong. Asa, give it up for our team from Grand Bahama. Madam Speaker, I rise this morning to give God thanks for good health and to inform this honorable house of some of the findings outlined in the 2019 National Non-Communicable Disease Risk Factors SEP survey completed in the last administration where a preliminary report was given. Unfortunately, the events of the past several years related to the devastating effects of Hurricane Dorian, the COVID-19 pandemic, along with some reanalysis of the data precluded the formal release of this report prior to this point. The most recent step, step survey generated enough data to fill two volumes detailing the number of findings that would allow my ministry to formulate evidence-based policies. Madam Speaker, this step survey was conducted between January and April of 2019 before Hurricane Dorian and the COVID pandemic. It involves some 2,365 persons ages 18 to 69, and there were three steps to the survey. Step one, captured demographic and behavioral data. Step two, collected physical measurements, such as blood pressure readings, height, weight, waist, and hip circumference. And step three, captured biochemical measurements, such as fasting blood glucose, total blood cholesterol readings, and urinary sodium and creatinine levels. All participants of the survey completed the first two steps, and the third step was completed by a subset of respondents. The survey instrument used was the WHO globally standardized tools and the response were analyzed by a team from the Pan American Health Organization, the Bahamas National Statistical Institute, and the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and was reported by sex and age. Madam Speaker, the findings were startling and highlighted individual risks, major gaps in our public health care system, which has failed to adequately address health inequalities. Here are some of the findings, Madam Speaker. 29.3% of respondents in the survey were diagnosed with hypertension, and 7% never had their blood pressure checked. The survey revealed that less than 60% of the respondents that were hypertensive were actually taking their medication as prescribed. The survey also revealed that about 40% of, of, of the participants were non-compliant with medication and had elevated blood pressure readings at the time of the survey. Also, about 9% of the persons with elevated blood pressure readings denied having a diagnosis of hypertension. Madam Speaker, 
When it came to diabetes, 12.8% of respondents reported that they were diabetic, and some 22.7% of the respondents reported that they have never had their blood sugar checked. Less than 45% of the respondents were actually taking medications for their diagnosed diabetes. The survey also revealed that 12% of the participants diagnosed with diabetes had elevated fasting blood sugar readings at the time of the survey. Also, almost 6% of the persons with raised blood sugar readings denied having been diagnosed with diabetes. Madam Speaker, 23.8% of participants were normal weight, and by using the body mass index, or the BMI, there were as many as 25.4% were classified as overweight, and 43.4% were classified as being obese, with a body mass index of over 40 or greater. This meant that almost 70% of the participants were either overweight or obese. Madam Speaker, the rate of physical inactivity was such that three in 10 persons did not meet the normal global recommendation for sufficient movement, and when totaling their total body or daily movement at home, at work, and even recreationally was inadequate. Madam Speaker, about half of the respondents drank three to seven alcoholic beverages per week for the 30 days leading up to the survey, and 30% of the respondents reported uh, as being lifetime uh, abstainers. 17.6 of the respondents had drank six or more standard drinks on one occasion before or during the 30 days before the survey. Madam Speaker, 17.4% of the survey participants spoke daily, smoked daily. 71.1% of the respondents never smoked. Of some concern, 12.1% of respondents were exposed to secondhand smoke at home, and 17.4% were exposed to secondhand smoke, smoke at the workplace. Madam Speaker, I can go on and on about the findings in this step survey. However, Madam Speaker, all is not lost. The Ministry of Health and Wellness will lead a comprehensive and evidence-based varied and multi, pronged response to the findings of this survey as we work with communities across the country aimed at correcting these serious health challenges facing the nations uh, by way of disease and brought on by lifestyle choices. My ministry will implement many modern treatment and management guidelines for the prevention of cardiovascular disease starting at the primary healthcare level. We will continue to strengthen health system infrastructure across the country with specific focus on the implementation of new digital platforms and monitoring apps aimed at meeting healthcare needs of our patients wherever they are. By way of our healthcare partners, we intend to purchase cost-effective, quality, safe medications to treat common medical conditions and establish a non-communicable disease registry to track the health and experience of persons with hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, among other conditions. Madam Speaker, we must reduce the incidence of non-communicable diseases and reduce the disease burden across the country. That is why I'm excited to announce that tomorrow morning my ministry will launch our new wellness unit whose main goal is to promote wellness across the country by putting the health back in the hands of the people. Madam Speaker, you may recall in my contribution in the last budget cycle, when I introduced a new line in my ministry budget called health and wellness, and for the first time putting real resources behind this important initiative. This new unit will support a sustained program at the community level engaging duly registered qualified para health and ally health providers to support the delivery of clinically proven care modalities 
mental health counseling, nutrition and counseling, and physical fitness training by qualified instructors. instructors. Through the wellness unit, my ministry intend to reach Bahamians wherever using innovative approaches to fight for the health of ordinary citizens, particularly Bahamians suffering from hypertension and diabetes, and yes, to transform the obesogenic environment to a leptogenic environment in order for us to begin the journey back to a normal body mass index. We will seek to establish and build partnerships with community groups and reach out to the Bahamas Public Parks and Beaches Authorities for their support. The vision is, in part, to sponsor supervised physical fitness training activities throughout the length and breadth of the Bahamas. We invite all those suitably credentialed fitness instructors to reach out to my ministry for more information and to find out how you can be a part of this exciting initiative. Madam Speaker, as Minister of Health and Wellness, and with the support of cabinet colleagues, I also intend to bring to this honorable house new legislation and regulations aim at reducing the importation of industrial produced trans fatty acids, known to be one of the key factors for cardiovascular disease. I also intend to put policies in place to reduce the consumption of salt, sugar, alcohol, and tobacco throughout the length of the Bahamas. Finally, Madam Speaker, this survey revealed that more than 10% of persons with hypertension, diabetes, or both at one point of time in their life sought advice from a traditional healer, with as much as 20% taking herbal and alternative treatments. My ministry will revisit plans to establish an indigenous medicines desk to ensure for the use of bush medicines and other treatments as they need to be regulated and introduced safely and in a proven manner into our community. Madam Speaker, this STEPS 2019 STEPS survey, though startling, really did not reveal much new information to the medical community. What it did do, however, was to help us to quantify the factors that contribute to our poor health status and the local evidence we all need to launch an aggressive push forward restoring the health of the Bahamian people. Madam Speaker, my ministry plans are very comprehensive, but we cannot do it alone. Changing course will require all hands on deck. Our approach must be multi-ministerial and I thank the Prime Minister and my cabinet colleagues for their unwavering support. Therefore, I'm calling on all agencies within my ministry, all government ministries and departments, the private sector, civil society, faith-based organization, and every citizen in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas to join hands, heads, and hearts now for help. There's much work to be done. Madam Speaker, I end my communication as I started with optimism that at all levels of society, we must work together to coordinate, collaborate, and calibrate our efforts in the pursuit to live longer, healthier, and more productive lives in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Thank you. which demonstrates clearly in full details the state of the health of the nation. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the document be brought up. Order the documents to lie on the table. Further communications? Yes, the Madam chair, Speaker. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Carmichael. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, Distinguished Ladies, Bahamas, good morning. I wish to begin by, as always, thanking my God for allowing me the opportunity to stand in this honorable place once again on behalf of the wonderful people 
of Carmichael, as well as, indeed, all right-thinking Bahamians everywhere. Madam Speaker, during my last communication on the 20th of February of this year, I provided the House with an update of the activities of the Department of Immigration. Today's communications, Madam Speaker, will cover the period from February 20th, ending the 21st of March, 2023. Madam Speaker, as I've always said in this House, and I will continue to say, this Davis-led administration will be measured by our actions and not by our words. Madam Speaker, yesterday, the 21st of March, 2023, a spokesperson from the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights speaking on conditions in Haiti said, since the beginning of the year up to the 15th of March, a total of 531 people were killed, 300 injured, and 277 kidnapped in gang-related incidents that took place mainly in the capital, Port-au-Prince, according to information gathered by the Human Rights Service of the United Nations Integrated Office in Haiti. In the first two weeks of March alone, clashes among gangs have left at least 208 killed, 164 injured, and 101 persons kidnapped. Madam Speaker, this adds to the continuing number of serial rapes of women and children by gangs in Haiti. Madam Speaker, given the challenges, the challenging situations on the ground, national security, immigration, and our partners continue to remain on high alert to detect and intercept persons seeking to enter the Bahamas illegally. During the discussions at CARICOM, chaired by the Honorable Prime Minister, the government emphasized the need for a regional and international response to the situation in Haiti. And I again, Madam Speaker, again call on all right-thinking Bahamians to, to, to continue to pray for our Honorable Prime Minister as he leads the regional charge to seek to re remedy the rapid deteriorating situation in Haiti. International reports, Madam Speaker, are that the situation in Haiti be on the agenda when the U.S. President, Joe Biden, visits Canada this week, with Washington reportedly seeking to persuade Ottawa to spearhead a security intervention aimed at stabilizing the violence-stricken Caribbean nation. And Madam Speaker, I will table the articles along with this communication when I'm completed. Um, the gang situation that's going on in Haiti, and Madam Speaker, we would have known now that more than 60% of the capital of port au prince is being taken over by the gangs. And Madam Speaker, I would also table, as part of this communication, an article by the United Nations where they are calling for foreign intervention on violence in Haiti. Whilst we continue, Madam Speaker, to hope for conditions to materially improve, the government of the Bahamas is resolute in its position that the immigration laws will be enforced and violators will be returned to their countries. Madam Speaker, the Department of Immigration continues to work diligently to protect our borders and land. Special operations are constantly being executed where we encounter persons who are here illegally or who have overstayed their time. Operation Restore, the special operation in Abaco, launched earlier this year, remains ongoing and have been strengthened through the deployment of additional officers on instructions from the Honorable Prime Minister. I wish to thank the Honorable Members of Central and South Abraco, John Pinder, and of course, North Abraco, Kirk Cornish, for the continued support. It is the resolve of this government, Madam Speaker, that every effort will be made to ensure that the decades-long issues surrounding unregulated migrants will be addressed, not just in Abaco alone. Madam Speaker, since the 20th of February of this year, Operation Restore has resulted in the arrest of 82 persons from Abaco who have been charged and put before the courts. They include 34 Haitian nationals and one American national who were charged with illegal entry, 23 Haitian nationals and three Jamaican nationals who were charged with overstaying, one Jamaican female for, who was charged with attempting to mislead an immigration officer. Madam Speaker, of the 83 persons charged before the court, 
82 persons were convicted. I believe, Madam Speaker, that this speaks of the hard work of the Immigration Department and its officers in carrying out their duties and exercising due diligence and investigations. I wish to thank the Director, Katira Ferguson, for her stellar leadership and, of course, and her support and the fine officers. Madam Speaker, since the launch of Operation Secure, we have received various requests on operations to be undertaken in other islands. I can assure the public that our immigration officers on the family islands are also doing their part as during the past months, persons have been arrested in Bimini, Eleuthera, and Grand Bahama, and have been brought to New Providence for further processing. Operation Secure, Madam Speaker, is the beginning and not the end of special operations on the family islands. Madam Speaker, I wish to take this opportunity to inform the public that our immigration officers are equipped with BITMAP devices, which share biographic and biometric data of suspected individuals from literally all over the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South America. We can track and detect criminals and criminal threats who are trying to enter our territory either by land or sea. Therefore, when a person is not landed or denied entry into the Bahamas, it is for a good and valid reason of which the public would not be aware of. And I will say no more on that subject, Madam Speaker, and I think many persons know what I'm talking about. Madam Speaker, for the past month, with effect from the 20th of February to date, 584 <laughs> repatriations have been conducted. It comprised 395 Haitians were sent back to Haiti, 167 Cubans were sent back to Cuba, eight Dominicans, three Peruvians, three Colombians, and eight other, eight other persons of various nationalities. Madam Speaker, just for the record, as I indicated, we'll be measured by our actions and not by our words. You'll recall that last year, we repatriated some 4,700 plus persons from the Bahamas at a cost of $1.5 million. <clears throat> but in January of this year, we'd have repatriated some 570 persons at a cost of $326,000. Madam Speaker, as I speak, and as from the statistics given, for this year alone, we would have repatriated in excess of 1,100 persons for the last two months. And if current trends continue, there is a very strong likelihood that we will, we will succeed or we will exceed uh, the numbers of last year in a very significant way. On Tuesday, the 21st of March, 2023, that is yesterday, a total of 202 persons were detained at a detention center. And they came from countries including South America, China, and Africa, Madam Speaker. The highest numbers, Ecuadorians, Brazilians, Haitians, Cubans, and Jamaicans. There are 24 persons in our safe house, of course, and we're talking about women and children. And Madam Speaker, we're continuing to see this growing trend where a significant number of children are being sent on these, uh, these voyages. Um, on the last occasion, I would have indicated on that voyage, there were some 51 children, which was the highest number of children ever found on one unsafe vessel. Madam Speaker, I wish to commend the new Haitian ambassador and the directorate in Haiti who have been very cooperative with our government in accepting the return of Haitians as quickly as possible. Despite the turmoil in their country at this time, they have fully accepted the responsibility of accepting their citizens who must be returned. The Haitian Embassy in New Providence has also assisted us greatly in identifying fraudulent documents. We appreciate their assistance and collaboration as we address this vaccine problem. Madam Speaker, I would be remiss of me if I did not constantly express my gratitude to our social partners in this fight. The Department of Immigration could not handle this situation alone. Therefore, we have a tripartite agreement with our uniform branches, the Royal Bahamas Defense Force and the Royal Bahamas Police Force, and our international partners, the United States Coast Guard. And Madam Speaker, I wish again to put on record where I wish to thank uh, the Honorable Minister of National Security, of course, and his men in those forces. Uh, anytime there is a challenge, they rise to the situation. 
And Madam Speaker, I will tell you from my own personal experience on the high seas, that is not no easy feat. And so I ask all Bahamians to continue to pray for our men and women on the high seas. <laughs> Madam Speaker, members may note that earlier in this week, the United States government's Department of State issued their human rights report outlining the status of human rights here in the Bahamas. The report contained several statements which do not fully explain the complexities of our constitutional system, citizenship laws, processes, and the requirements for the government to act within the laws and the mandate given to us by the Bahamian people. For example, the report stated, there are no reliable estimates of numbers of persons without a confirmed nationality. The report then proceeds to excessively discuss matters related to statelessness and the absence of laws to prevent it. Madam Speaker, our Constitution, that is the Bahamas Constitution, and the Nationality Act provides for the basis of citizenship. If a person decides for whatever reason not to obtain a passport or other documentation for the country of which they are entitled citizenship, they are not stateless. I will address the report more fully in a later contribution, Madam Speaker. But for the moment, I will say that this government, Madam Speaker, was elected by the people of this great commonwealth to protect the sovereign integrity of the Bahamas. We will keep the Bahamas for Bahamians. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I close by thanking the team at the Department of Immigration, our police, our defense force, and our international partners for all their hard work in protecting our borders and enforcing our immigration laws and policies. Madam Speaker, the Bahamas maintains an organized system to allow for the lawful entry and orderly processes of applications for entry into the Bahamas. This is the only process by which persons should enter this country. Anyone who enters the Bahamas illegally will be arrested, charged, convicted, and deported immediately. The public is encouraged, therefore, to continue to support and report violations of our immigration laws and or suspected unlawful landings to lawful enforcement at the Department of Immigration. And I will give the numbers again. The numbers are 604-0172, 604-0172, 604-0172, and 604-0196. Information can also be forwarded to our website at www.immigration.gov.bs under the tab, Contact Us. May God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'll table the report. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the document be brought up. Order the document lie on the table. Further statement and communications? Thank you, Honorable Member. We will now move down the order of business. Communications by the clerk. Messages from the Governor General. Messages from the Senate. Motions for leave of absence, leave to resign seat in New Ritz. Presentations of petitions. Presentations of reports of committees. Adoption of reports of committees. First reading of bills. Thank you, Honorable Member. Second reading and committal of bills. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madam. <laughs> Madam Speaker. <laughs> Um, I rise to move for the second reading and committal of the committal of the International Commercial Arbitration Bill 2023. 
And might I add, Madam Speaker, that we wish to, we have a, a companion bill, um, which is as a consequence of this bill, and that is the arbitration amendment bill, which is the principal arbitration domestic bill, um, which we would wish to do as a companion. They, as a result of this bill, certain amendments are required in the um, principal bill, which is the domestic arbitration bill. So we wish to do those two together. They're all really what I call non-controversial bills. Um, and um, and uh, I move, as I said, for the second reading and middle of these two bills. Pardon me? Do it too. Oh, you have the arbitration amendment bill? They, they were already laid. They were both laid. They were both laid. <coughs> they were both laid. Hmm? Yeah, but, but, but in fact, what happens is that as a consequence, the international commercial bill don't apply to trust issues. And so we're just clarifying in the domestic bill. Those, uh, that, that, that domestic bill, the Arbitration Act applies, and with the various, some, some provisions that will be mandatory, um, which I'll explain uh, in my contribution. But it's, as I said, it's non-controversial. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Senate. Just to clarify some of this um, confusion, yesterday at 2.54 p.m., I was notified by the government business leader, uh, his words, we will proceed with the arbitration bill tomorrow. We will pick up when we return on the 15th with answers to the tourism and central bank bill. There was no mention of a compendium of bills being debated today. There is a bill table before the House, and it's referred to as the arbitration amendment bill. That is the bill that the members of the opposition prepared for. There is also a substantially larger bill, International Commercial Arbitration Bill, which the Prime Minister has just made mention of, but that was not um, brought to our attention by the government side as being on the table or on the agenda for debate today. You know. <laughs> <laughs> ready to debate for me. If this is a primary school, a good member would understand the rules of the government. You don't want to take me on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Members? Uh, obviously, 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 he don't understand the rules of the government. No, he doesn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Just by that. Yeah. Just by that remark, just by that remark, he, he doesn't appreciate the rules of government. But that, but, but Mr. But Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, all right, Madam Speaker, just, just, just for clarity, just for clarity, once, once, once a, once a bill, honorable member, once. What? Honorable oh, member. Oh, oh no, I'm going to hear from the Prime Minister now. Honorable member. I'm not, I'm not Prime Minister. Honorable member. Let's not answer members who, who are seated from their seat. The Prime Minister now. For the, for the, for the, edif for the edification of members. Right. The House is required to give notice in respect to. Bills and resolutions. Right. And once a bill or resolution is laid, that is notice to be given for the. Yeah, right. yeah so, so no, 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 that's the point. I mean, so I, I, I just want the, the member to appreciate. By, by way of courtesy, we discuss what will happen, but it, 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 there's no binding. Uh, Provisions for that. I mean, and we, and I don't want to talk about the past. Just talk no. about the future. Just be ready for any bill. But we'll, we will, as best we can, give the notice. We'll give further verbal notice. Say, look, this is what we'll do next. And we try to do that. 
Now, the reason why we didn't do, deal with the bill that we said we'd deal with today is that I got your letter, I think, late on Monday afternoon, and I've given instructions to, to respond to you and provide you with the information, which I think, because there's clearly um, a misunderstanding of, and it's, it, that could be, that has to be cleared up, and, and you would need to be able to be informed to see whether your position in respect to that matter is still obtained. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And right. So I, I want you to look at it, and, and I mean, I'm, I don't intend to persuade you, but I think, but I think you, you are wise enough to read and understand what you read. So that's, and hopefully that, that reading and understanding will bring you to where we are in respect to that amendment. And so we decided to, to identify a bill to which all of us have been talking about for many, many years. And it's been made on the table. <laughs> and it's been there on the table. What's on, on the agenda? You can, you can, but, but you just reach, so they, it also <laughs> better. <laughs> also better. <laughs> so sorry, sorry. No, I, I don't. <laughs> uh, uh, so that, so that, so that. I, I, I don't mean that to insult you. I just mean that to say. <coughs> yeah. But be ready. Be, be good. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Just be ready. 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 Be prepared. Yeah, you ready? Any one of those we could start today. Be ready. Anyone. 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 Let's let the. Let's do the ball. Madam Speaker. Marco City. 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 The women of Grand Bahama. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to see your government at work uh, in this place. And uh, it is indeed refreshing that, and it's inspiring to all of us to know that uh, you continue to stay the course, all of you. Um, uh, the chairperson, Judas, uh, welcome, and all of you. Um, we welcome you. Have that we appreciate you. We continue to love you, and do enjoy that um, lunch today. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, Madam Speaker, as we <coughs> as we eagerly anticipate. The 50th anniversary of our independence. Hmm? Oh, well, I'd also like to welcome um, His Excellency, His Excellency uh, Ruby and Darling. Hi, Excellency. Hi, Excellency. My good cousin. I, I trust you knew that the women were going to be here, and that's why you joined us today. <laughs> what a coincidence. Yeah. What a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. As we eagerly anticipate, Madam Speaker, the 50th anniversary of our independence in July, today, I'd like us to gather to honor the birthday of a visionary leader who played an instrumental role in shaping our great nation. You have noted that earlier in your opening, Sir Lyndon Finley. Yes. You know, his life and legacy are indelibly intertwined with the story of our journey to independence. And it's only fitting that we reflect on his contributions as we approach this significant, significant milestone of our 50th anniversary. So Lyndon Piddling, known as the father of the nation, was a man of unwavering determination and courage. He led our country with a clear vision for a brighter future. 
championing the cause of justice, equality, and progress. His leadership was instrumental in our struggle for self-determination, helping to forge a new path and a new identity for our nation. Under Sir Lyndon's guidance, we emerge from the shackles of colonialism to stand proudly on the global stage as a sovereign and independent nation. His commitment to social justice and his relentless pursuit of a better life for all Bahamians laid the foundation for the strong and prosperous society we enjoy today. As we commemorate Sir Lyndon's birthday, let us remember the lessons he taught us about unity, about resilience, and about the power of a shared vision. We must continue to work together, following in his footsteps, to build a nation that is inclusive, vibrant, and prosperous. A nation that truly embodies the spirit of one Bahamas. In this year of our 50th independence anniversary, let us celebrate Sir Lyndon, his legacy, by recommitting, recommitting ourselves to the ideals that he held dear. Let us look to the future with confidence with ambition and with pride as we continue the work he began, creating a Bahamas that stands as a beacon of hope and opportunity for generations to come. Yeah. <clears throat> Happy birthday, Sir Linda. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> as we seek to expand and diversify the Bahamian economy, we must support our economic development with mechanisms that will enhance our national development plans. For a long time, we have talked about the Bahamas taking steps towards becoming an international arbitration center. In 2009, that talk eventually materialized in the form of the 2009 Arbitration Act, which was an important first step, but did not go far enough to fulfill our ambitions of becoming a regional leader for alternative dispute resolution. Today, through the International Commercial Arbitration Act 2023 and the Arbitration Amendment Bill 2023, we are signaling to the world that we are committed to improving our arbitration framework so that people and companies operating in the Bahamas can feel a sense of security when they do business within our borders. They will know <clears throat> that there are convenient and accessible mechanisms in place through which they can resolve conflicts without having to go through lengthy and costly proceedings. Madam Speaker, over the past year, this administration has promoted the Bahamas as a safe harbor for financial services and investments. As a safe harbor, we have weathered storm after storm, both lit literally and figuratively. Through it all, we have emerged stronger than ever. Investors have taken notice. We have investments in the pipeline by the billions. That's billions, Madam Speaker, with a B. This includes unprecedented, unprecedented investments in Grand Bahama, Abaco, Long Island, the Exomas, Eleuthera, and Meguana, each of which have seen private sector investments in the hundreds of millions. The wind is in our sails, and we must keep the momentum going. Becoming an international arbitration center is a critical step toward tapping into our full potential as a jurisdiction. 
It is no coincidence that the same characteristics that make us a safe harbor for investments also make us a great location for arbitration. Within our shores, we have an excellent legal framework developed by our talented legal professionals. I'm willing to bet that no other country on a per capita basis has more legal and financial talent than the Bahamas. Bahamian professionalism is unrivaled. And I repeat that. Bahamian professionalism is unrivaled. We are also ideally located to be a hub for arbitration. Just as our location makes us a regional leader in financial services and a major shipping hub for the Western Hemisphere, we are an ideal, an ideal location for regional businesses to make use of our arbitration services. Taking into account our proximity to the US, our legal talent, and our financial services and investments expertise, honestly, Madam Speaker, the deck is stacked in our favor. There's no reason for us not to be successful in this endeavor, not when our Bahamian excellence is on full display. It is a shame that we have not yet adequately tapped into our potential as an international arbitration center. But this administration is committed yeah. to changing that. Yeah. The steps that we are taking today are long overdue, Madam Speaker. The Arbitration Amendment Bill 2023 amends the existing act to include the resolution of trust disputes and further clarifies and defines relevant, relevant provisions within the law to promote the efficient and cost-effective resolution of trust disputes. Mm -hmm. For instance, in cases where there is intent to enter into an agreement that was, that was intended to be part of another arbitration agreement that did not pan out, the, the initial dependent agreement will now be treated as a valid and distinct agreement whereas it was questionable whether that initial agreement would have been legally enforceable or valid. This amendment also now, that is the amendment uh, to the Arbitration Act, third amendment, also now, speci now specifically holds parties liable who knowingly and unlawfully disclose confidential information contrary to established agreements as bad faith actors within an arbitration process. We are creating a more secure and confidential environment in which individuals and companies can be assured that any disputes will be resolved in a comprehensive and a fair way. Taken together, these amendments further enhance our nation's reputation as a reliable and trustworthy jurisdiction. With the modernization and strengthening of existing arbitration framework, we are now aligned with international best practices. In fact, Madam Speaker, you know there's something called the United Nations uh, Unisic Trial. It is the United, let, let me give you the exact uh, term, but this is, this is model after the United Nations um, United on the International um, the UNICEF trial, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. And, and, and in that concept, they, they develop a model for arbitration to which they recommend that most disputes be and we have followed that and, in fact, incorporated those provisions in this new bill so as to ensure that we are uh, engaging and embracing international best practices. Uh, given the, Madam Speaker, 
given the importance of financial services as a second pillar of our economy, which employs many talented Bahamians, the inclusion of trust dispute resolution is a major advancement that opens the door to many possibilities. The global financial services market is very competitive, and to stay ahead of the competition, we must remain on the cutting edge, ensuring that settlers of trust and trustees and beneficiaries can rely on an arbitration processes to resolve disputes. And this is absolutely necessary to strengthen our financial services product. Wealth management experts and those in search of wealth management services can be sure that the Bahamas will be top choice for them for um, wealth uh, protection and wealth growth. growth. And that's what we are intending to be. Top choice in respect to wealth protection and wealth growth. Madam Speaker, to fully embrace our potential as an international arbitration center, it was necessary for us to develop a fully realized modern bill that standardizes international com commercial arbitration process and indicated the model under which it was, um, that it was tailored after and tailored to suit our purposes. The International Commercial Arbitration Bill that we just mentioned, introduces a streamlined, transparent, and efficient legal framework for dispute resolution. In this bill, we now have clear rules governing dispute resolution between international parties involved in commercial agreements with Bahamian entities outside the bounds of the Civil Court or the Supreme Court. This bill establishes the grounds for an arbitration agreement as a written agreement entered into willingly by both parties. It does not force those who, from the onset, desire to resolve disputes from the courts. It is, however, a solution for those who prefer the efficiency of alternative dispute resolution uh, to the more arduous, complex sometimes, litigation process. The bill goes on to specify the composition and jurisdiction of an, of an arbitral tribunal, including grounds and procedures for challenging an arbitrator, as well as the process for determining whether or not a tribunal has jurisdiction over a matter. The rules regarding interim and preliminary measures are clearly outlined as well as the conduct of proceedings themselves. <laughs> Within this bill is the provision that all parties are treated equally and are given a full opportunity to present their case. The place of arbitration, the language of the proceedings, and the powers of the tribunal throughout the proceedings are all established. Tribunals will now have the power to appoint experts and extend time limits. The bill also protects the, confiden co the confidentiality of proceedings and awards. Provisions have been made regarding settlements between parties, the making of awards, the termination of proceedings, and the enforcement of awards. Um, Madam Speaker, this was quite a comprehensive effort. We'll find that both bills before us are competitive with legislation found in the top international arbitration centers. I'm aware that there were members opposite and former cabinet members who may have talked a lot about arbitration and the previous administration. We have now turned all that talk yeah. into action. It is very important that we got these two bills right. Arbitration has far-reaching implications when it comes to expanding access to resolutions in commercial and business disputes. 
If we are serious about growing our economy and diversifying into new industries, we must ensure that investors and corporations are comfortable with our dispute resolution framework. So for example, Madam Speaker, we talk um, a lot about our yacht registry coming on stream. We talk a lot about our uh, marine industry, uh, uh, merchant shipping act and all that. Well, primarily most of, most of that industry, marine, they, they are, most of their disputes are settled by arbitration. And, and so we could, by setting this up, we are immediately, we have a captured sort of, we have a captured audience in that, in, in that space. Once they know we have this, we set it up. The, again, having regard to our standing in the, in, uh, in, in, in the, in your, uh, the registration of the IMO and all registration, uh, the flag, the ships are ship registration. Ship registration. Um, we, 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 this, this could be a very lucrative um, intervention in our economy. Nature. And so, so you know, the, the Minister of, of Transport is, is alerted to this, and she's chopping at the bits to get cracking and working in this regard. So like I said, if we are serious about growing our economy and diversifying into new industries, we must ensure that investors and corporations are comfortable with our dispute resolution framework. As an international arbitration hub, we will attract more foreign investment to our shores while reassuring domestic investors that there are protection in place for them. We are improving the general business environment by providing all businesses with an affordable, efficient means of addressing conflicts that may arise. Local businesses who engage in international trade will be able to enter into agreements based on our laws and be certain that a fair process, process will be in place to resolve any differences that may arise. Overall, our legal system will be strengthened and the perception of our system will be enhanced as the adoption of international best practices boosts our credibility and establishes our reputation as an emerging hub for arbitration. Uh, Madam Speaker, among the most exciting developments that will emerge from our venture into international arbitration are the opportunities that we will create for local professionals. Yeah, yeah. Bahamians will gain the necessary experience in international arbitration mm -hmm. to position themselves as experts, creating exciting prospects yeah. for our professionals both here and abroad. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that we have the talent to be the leading arbitration hub in the region. We have already done it with financial services. Yeah. Now we will do it again with arbitration. Yeah. I do acknowledge that we still have a lot of work to do to fully realize our, our arbitration potential. In addition to strengthening our framework, we must now put in place the proper professional and promotional resources to establish ourselves as a regional hub. Our work is far from over. I am sure that those who have been pushing for progress over the years are happy to see real movement. Moving forward, we will engage industry stakeholders and commit to working together to make our vision of the Bahamas as a top international arbitration center a reality. Madam Speaker, national development is a complex and comprehensive undertaking requiring wide-ranging expertise and talented innovators capable of driving progress. As a government, our job is to serve as a catalyst for change and a vehicle for empowerment so that our nation builders can do what they do best. 
my faith in the Bahamian people's ability to take this country to higher levels has never been stronger. In every industry imaginable, locally and internationally, we have already achieved at the highest levels. Just look around us. The true test of this administration will be how many lives we can touch, how many dreams we can support, and how many people we can uplift. I look forward to the new opportunities for Bahamians that will be created through the bills before us today, as well as the many initiatives that we have launched since September 2021. We are steadily working toward a better Bahamas for all, Madam Speaker, and I thank you. God. Continue to bless us. I so move. Thank you, Honorable Member. Is there a seconder? The chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Golden Gate. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, before I begin my contribution, I would like to join in and uh, wish a happy heavenly birthday to the father of our nation, Sir Lyndon Oscar Pindling, who would have been celebrating his 93rd birthday today. Um, I have fond memories of him growing up. I always say he's why I'm a PLP. I admired his tenacity, his strength, his vision for equality, uh, the fact that he had the common touch, although he traveled around this world and, uh, and spoke and met and sat around tables with kings and queens, he never lost the common touch. He was our prime minister and growing up, I had opportunities to be in his presence. And that, that meant a lot to me. I remember his passing, I was in my mid-teens then, and I remember the profound impact his passing had on my life, so I am grateful that I still have a relationship with this beautiful and dear wife, the dame, Marguerite Pindling, uh, great friends with his son, Obi, and a number of his other children. And today, I stand with everyone who has so far spoken and give my heavenly birthday greetings to him. I want to acknowledge the work of my colleague, Her Excellency Leslie Bryce, and the Secretariat, Fittingly, on Friday, the 24th of March, which is this week, at 6.30 p.m. in the Grand Ballroom at Baja Mar, there will be a continuation of the 1973 Masterclass series. And this week, this Friday's Masterclass is featuring the life and legacy of Sir Lyndon Pindling. So for those who remember him fondly like me and who had the opportunity to watch him uh, to be a part of the decades that he has served, this is an opportunity for us to go and reflect. But for most importantly for me, for the young people who may not even understand why we speak so highly of this father of our nation, this is an opportunity for the young people to come out and understand the life and legacy of Sir Lyndon Oscar Pindling. Yeah. I want to recognize a female trailblazer, Her Excellency, Ruby Ann Cooper Darling, a fellow at Zuma gal like me, I want to recognize you and thank you for your presence here and all the work that you have done in make, making the way for us ladies who stand in this honorable place today. Madam Speaker, the house is more beautiful today than it usually is because we are graced by the women, the women now. Our beautiful, strong women of the Grand Bahama Women's Branch, Miss Grace, and all of these beautiful ladies. Madam Speaker, you know, politically, especially in this party, the women have been the strength, the backbone, the political strategist, the voice in the air of the Salindans, um, even the Philip Brave Davises. The women have been more than the fritter friars. Yes. We have been the, women, the people who have undergirded this party, undergirded this nation. And I want to thank you and honor you for being here today, continuing the fight. I know 
that is your shoulders on which we stand. I know that even though you are physically here today in the parliament supporting us, this is what it looks like every time we're in the parliament. You're always out there watching us, cheering us on, and doing what the work is that needs to be done to support not only the women, but to support our government, our administration, our nation. So I honor you. I thank you for being here today. Now I'll get to my contribution, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I hope oh, goodness. Madam Speaker, oh, no. I happily rise today to second the two bills before us, the International Commercial Arbitration Bill 2023 and the Arbitration Amendment Bill 2023. Before going into detail on these bills, please permit me to briefly address the families of the Golden Gates constituency. First of all, I want to extend my condolences to the families of Ruby Cambridge, Princess Margaret Emmanuel, Nathaniel Braden, Philip Collymore, Ronald Pine Roker, and just yesterday, Theodore Teddy Larimore. May their souls rest in peace. May their families be comforted during this time of bereavement. I want to wish Ronnie and Marcia McCartney congratulations on their recent marriage, and I pray that they may have many years of beautiful wedded bliss. I would like to thank, I'll join in my colleague from Carmichael in thanking the Royal Bahamas Police Force, our Commissioner of Police, who is also a constituent of Golden Gates, Mr. Clayton Fernanda, Inspector 2794 Ramming, for their concerted and consistent help in controlling and monitoring the criminal activity in our constituency. Their hard work, their dedication is appreciated, and I think it has provided us with minimal cr criminal activity in the constituency. And I don't want to take for granted that their presence, their work, uh, their immediate response when I call hasn't made a difference in our constituency. So finally, I would also like to note that the BJC and BGCSE math and English tutoring is going extremely well in Golden Gates. I'm particularly encouraged by the number of young men and young boys that have taken advantage of the tutoring. And I want to remind constituents that the classes are held on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4 to 6 p.m. up until the 25th of May. And it's for any Golden Gates constituents only uh, that are interested, that are in need. Thank you to the parents who are, we're only responding to your request, um, who are allowing their students, their children to participate. Um, and it's always a joy and a privilege to represent the people of Golden Gates and to provide for them all the things that they request and need. We will continue to press forward on our platform of empowerment education and enterprise. Madam Speaker, anyone who's ever gone through civil lit litigation knows how long it can take and how expensive it can be. That is no fault of the courts. There are limited resources and many cases to be overseen. I am an enthusiastic supporter of alternative dispute resolution because I support people having access to legal remedies. While we often talk about ADR in terms of how investors and large enterprises can benefit, we must also focus on how it can benefit the average person. Workers who have issues with companies and small businesses that find themselves in disputes with larger businesses can all benefit from a robust ADR framework in the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, it's not uncommon to hear of people who had strong cases against companies who simply ran out of money during the civil proceedings or could not afford to go to court at all. For a person to be legally wronged but have no way to remedy the situation is a form of injustice. For a company to be taken advantage of and then strong armed by a larger company with no accessible recourse does not bode well for business. This is not to say that such practices happen all the time, or that every dispute is so black and white. But when such matters do occur, I believe that people and businesses deserve accessible resolution. By embracing alternative dispute resolution, we are doing the people of the Bahamas a great service. Of course, ADR is not new. 
the ADR movement has been gaining momentum over several decades, and the outcomes generated by the movement toward ADR have generally been positive and often provide similar outcomes to the outcome of a court case. The main difference being that remedies gained through alternative dispute resolution are typically faster and more affordable. Since the mid-2000s, there have been talks about establishing the Bahamas as an international commercial arbitration center, an alternative dispute resolution hub. We're still not quite where we need to be for individuals or organizations to benefit in large numbers from local ADR processes. For international commercial arbitration, the rationale is that this will make the Bahamas more attractive to investors while developing a new subsector that would boost trade and other commercial activities. Despite the Arbitration Act being passed in 2009, an actual ADR unit within the government was not created until August of 2020. That is over a decade in which we did not have a unit specifically dedicated to driving progress on our goal to become an international hub for arbitration. The International Commercial Arbitration Bill has been considered for a number of years. The Economic Recovery Committee report in 2020 recommended taking this step as an area of untapped economic potential. There wasn't, I, I beg to differ respectfully with our Prime Minister, there wasn't a lot of action on the previous administrative registrations part when it came to taking the advice. But they talked about it a little. Our PM said they talked about it a lot, but based on my research, they talk about it a little. There's a good need to ensure that investor protection mechanisms and reforms to investor dispute settlements are in place and as well as the need to bolster our dispute resolution framework through alignment with the Singapore Convention, and our Prime Minister would have also mentioned uh, UNITRAL, which is the UN Commission on International Trade and Law. I hope that through continued collaboration with industry stakeholders, as well as public education, we're able to get more Bahamians excited about the possibilities within ADR and arbitration. Madam Speaker, the International Commercial Arbitration Bill 2023 takes us one step closer to fulfilling the promise of the Bahamas as a fully functioning region leading center for international commercial arbitration. By modernizing and streamlining international commercial arbitration processes, we are providing a fast, comprehensive, and accessible means for international dispute resolution between commercial entities. Through this bill, we are establishing the grounds for international arbitration, protecting the confidentiality of involved parties, governing settlements and awards, and providing guidelines for the termination and enforcement of agreements. It's quite a comprehensive and impressive undertaking, and I cannot overstate how critical this bill is to improved investor confidence and generally strengthening the business environment. When investors are confident, obviously they invest. And what typically follows successful investments is economic growth. Becoming an international arbitration hub will have its perks. People generally like doing business in places known for facilitating fair outcomes when disputes arise. It's sort of like an insurance, Madam Speaker. Nobody wants a dispute to arise, but it doesn't hurt to do business in a place known for handling disputes well, just in case. We are positioning the Bahamas to be that safe business space for the entire region. With these latest bills, you can now sit our legal framework alongside any other jurisdictions and our laws will be competitive. That is a cause for confidence. If we are going to fulfill our ambition of becoming a regional hub, it only makes sense that we would ensure that our legal foundation ranks up there with the best in the world. Such thoughtful, innovative legislation can only be the product of widespread consultation with public and private sector stakeholders. Many of the minds that contributed to the development of these bills will go on to become service providers within this new subsector. We do 
have an impressive slate of talent in this country, as the member for Cat Island, Ramki and San Salvador has said. As this new industry grows and matures, I have no doubt that the experience gained will allow our local professionals to establish themselves as world-class experts. This is exactly what this New Day government is all about. We are pursuing economic diversification in ways that create legitimate, lucrative opportunities for Bahamians. Madam Speaker, the Arbitration Amendment Bill 2023 makes two major changes. It broadens and replaces the existing arbitration of trust disputes in the Trustees Act, Chapter 176, and it amends the Arbitration Act, 2009. This bill expands the interpretation section, clarifies the scope, defines mandatory and non-mandatory provisions, and addresses confidentiality, challenges, and appeals. Ultimately, this amendment ensures that trust disputes and other relevant disputes can be resolved through efficient and cost-effective arbitration processes that are aligned with international best practices. What this signals to the international financial services community is that the Bahamas has yet another competitive advantage in our arsenal. Once again, the logic is simple. People are more comfortable generating, storing, and managing their wealth when they know that in the unlikely event that a dispute rises, they will have an accessible and fair way to handle and address that dispute. Madam Speaker, the Bahamas is already well positioned to be a top jurisdiction for international commercial arbitration and alternative dispute resolution. We have already incorporated many international conventions and best practices. We have high caliber legal and judicial professionals who can provide top notch services. We are a prime target for investments and financial services, and we now have a robust, modern legal framework. I fully expect our Bahamian professionals to rise to the occasion. This is just one example of many as we grow and diversify the Bahamian economy and create opportunities at every level. This year alone, this Davis administration has made progress on digital assets and financial services, agriculture, sustainable tourism, to name a few of the major moves we've made. We are securing private sector investments in many of our islands and hitting record numbers in tourism. Our economic plans are bearing fruit, and we still have over three more years to go in this first term, Madam Speaker. <laughs> three years is not a very long time, but it's long enough to make a difference in the lives of Bahamians. In fact, I believe the Bahamian people already see a clear difference in their lives compared to what they experienced under the previous administration. This administration has approached the task of governance with a sense of urgency. We don't let a single day go by without working towards advancing our agenda on behalf of the Bahamian people. As a result, needed reforms like the bills before us today are finally seeing the light of day, the light of a new day. Madam Speaker, we will continue to push forward with our people-focused agenda to create a better Bahamas for all. I second this bill, and may God bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Thank you, Honorable Member. It has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read a second time and committed. Arbitration Amendment Bill 2023, as many. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Marco City. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank Almighty God for this opportunity to once again be able to rise in this place on behalf of Bahamian people in general and the people of Marco City in particular. Madam Speaker, I mentioned Marco City. I, as I look to my left, I want to uh, once again join colleagues opposite in welcoming the members of the Progressive Liberal Party Women's Association to the Parliament 
I so look forward to working with all of you in 2026. <laughs> and, and, and thank you, and thank you in advance for your support. <laughs> but to certainly, certainly applaud you for the work you've been doing uh, over these many years. Let me, let, yes, our tent is very big. And I've had, Madam Speaker, the honor of collaborating with and speaking on the same platform with some of the women who are present here today and who absolutely love our country in general and Grand Bahama in particular. Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I'd like to join others in celebrating the birthday of our founding uh, father, Sir Lyndon Oscar Pinling, who has made a tremendous contribution, not just to the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, I remember as a student at, at Tuskegee University, testifying before the United Nations, joining other activists from throughout the United States and globally who were calling for the end of apartheid and the work, the body of work of Bahamian activists, including uh, Sir Linden, loomed large at that time because his voice was one that resonated on the international stage in calling for an end to apartheid. So we had, while, while I was certainly as a student at the College of the Bahamas, opposed to the then PLP, we always recognized uh, certainly the incredible contribution of our founding fathers and mothers. And we never, despite opposing, opposing the PLP at that time, we appreciated the seminal work done by those men and women in transitioning us from uh, minority rule to majority rule and shepherding us through independence. Ironically, Madam Speaker, you know, the, the world is a cycle. During that period, the member for Fox Hill, the member for Fox Hill, <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> he had not yet found his way back to the PLP. He, in fact, in fact, I remember, I remember speaking on multiple platforms, on multiple platforms, and I remember one in particular at E.P. Roberts as a young activist. Uh, where we, and we did so with respect, we opposed the then PLP and the then uh, founding father of the country uh, with significant uh, respect, but we saw the world differently. And the member for Fox Hill was one of those speakers on the platform where I spoke. And, and, and he was, in fact, quite aggressive in his opposition back then to the Progressive Liberal Party. Um, obviously, Madam Speaker, he has been converted and he is now, he's now back, he's now back in the fold. And so, <laughs> and so, and so Madam, Madam Speaker, we remind him of those days when, when, when he, when he saw, as Sir Cecil did, and so as I stand to celebrate Dame Marguerite, uh, because oftentimes we celebrate the men who have been at the forefront, but we know for a fact, Madam, Madam Speaker, that most, if not all of the, these men would not have been successful had it not been for the woman standing on the side of them and undergirding them. And so we celebrate Dame Marguerite in this context. Um, um, and of course, I know the member for Fox Hill joins me in, in saluting her and recognizing the incredible work that she has done over, over time. Yeah. <laughs> so, Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker, Sir Cecil Wallace Whitfield was born on the 20th of March. And so we in the free national movement and by extension in the Progressive Liberal Party celebrate the incredible vision and fearlessness and insightfulness of successful Wallace Whitfield. Madam Speaker, it is a difficult thing. It is a difficult thing in the Bahamian culture that when you are in the midst of a comfort zone, imagine this, you help a party win the general election and just three years later as you began, to borrow a phrase, to see the light, you decide that you will transition out of a comfort zone Madam Speaker, there are persons who, who fail to take risk. For example, the members, the members opposite 
I did not join the member for Angleston as she, as she remembered a commitment made while in opposition, while in opposition, she remembered that she had a difficulty with the RCL deal. And therefore, therefore, when she came to government, she decided that she was prepared to stay with her original position, even when the leader of her party was doing something, I, I, the phrase I believe in Bahamian parlance is flip flop. In other words, prior to election, he opposed the granting of certain privileges and opportunities uh, to RCL, and in fact, was on the record in a very strong emotional uh, statement. He talked about the importance of empowering Bahamian entrepreneurs. And then when given an opportunity in government to do so, he decided that since it's a new day, it may be plausible that people would believe that this is a new deal and therefore he could backpedal. I think, I think, I think, I think Michael Jackson say moonwalk from his original statement. And, 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 the, and the member for Angleston decided that she was not going to flip-flop. And so she decided to stay with her original position. She does not like a deal, a deal that cabinet has already uh, uh, given its signature, its blessing to, Madam Speaker. It's gone to the uh, National Economic Council. It's my understanding that it even went to a subcommittee of cabinet, and yet the member for Angleston, who we applaud, we love her fire. We love her spirit. She, unfortunately, she has flown in the face of cabinet code and the, and the cabinet manual. And so she has violated the most basic principle of collective responsibility. But we love her spirit and we love her stance. That is the Honorable A.D. Hannah. We, we do too. We do, we, we do too. The chair, the chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Fox Hill. I just thought the member had breakfast this morning without a Ross Nest. You ate Ross Nest this morning. But, but um, the, the, the matter of the code and the violation of the code. Matter for the judgment of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has issued a statement. The code was not violated. So that, that is not correct. That's not correct. So. Thank you, Honorable Ma Madam Speaker, I, I was talking about Successor Wallace Whitfield's birthday and his willingness to take a principled stand on an important issue. The member, the member for Fox Hill, unfortunately, um, have not read the Prime Minister's comment. The Prime Minister has sought to throw a lifeline to the member uh, for Angleston. And let me just tie it in. I'm just simply saying that it is wonderful when people move out of their comfort zone to stand on the basis of principle. Unfortunately, in this case... The chair, the chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Fox Hill. Yes, yes ma'am. There was a formal statement issued by the government on Sunday. The formal statement from the Prime Minister said precisely what I said, that he's satisfied there was no breach of the code. Yes. And what I've told people about this, right, is all this stuff about um, collective responsibility and all the rest of it. At the end of the day, the person who decides this stuff is the Prime Minister. If he says ain't no breach, ain't no breach. It's as simple as that. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Mad Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister, just this morning, I, I, the member may not have the member may not have had a chance to read the statement by the Prime Minister this morning, but the Prime Minister said he is satisfied that the member for Angleston, ironically the Minister of Education, didn't quite understand the deal. And that when and that Yes, certainly the by chair recognizes your honorable member for Fox Hill. Please what stop you the are referring to. Please stop the clock. <laughs> No, you go a minute over every time, anyhow. No, what you were what you were referring to, I believe, is what appeared in the newspaper this morning. My reading of that was an interview which was done on Saturday, right? Which was before the formal statement was issued. So the Guardian is just, you know, being clever, baiting and switching to create mischief. The fact is, the formal position was stated by the government on Sunday, That's and it. it is what it is. That's it. That's uh, it. Madam, 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 Madam Speaker, since, we, since we're going to engage in, in linguistic gymnastics, let me just talk to the Bahamian people. The reality is, the reality is, here is a deal that both the Minister of Tourism, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister indicate their unqualified 
fully qualified, any direction you go in, support for the deal. The only thing that was outstanding when pressed by the, the press was whether or not there had been an environmental impact assessment submitted or an environmental a management plan. There were no other major issues on, on the table. This is a matter that we invite the member to come on his feet and say it did not go to NEC, it did not go to any subcommittee of cabinet. The reality is this cabinet has embraced this project. This is their new uh, best friend, right? And, and so the reality is all cabinet ministers are bound by collective responsibility. The problem, the problem, the problem is there, there's one member who decided they will go against the grain to stay consistent with their earlier statement. They have, in fact, breached a cabinet code. The prime minister, a smart, uh, a personable uh, gentleman from Kent Island, who we respect, Madam, Madam Speaker. However, what he is not is Jehovah. So his word, the fact that he issued a statement does not make it unimpeachable. It is impeachable in this regard. We are saying, Oh, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Fox Hill. He's Jehovah, or whether he's unimpeachable or any of that. All I'm saying is this. There is a code. The code itself, the code itself allows the prime minister is the arbiter of the code. That's all I'm saying. So the question was raised by these good gentlemen opposite. They are entitled to make whatever noise they wish about collective responsibility. A convenience, of course, which they seem to forget oh, oh, in their own regime. Oh, bad. Right? But fine. You're entitled to make whatever political noise you want to make. The, the simple point I'm making is the arbiter of the document, the arbiter of the code is the prime minister. Qua prime minister, he said there was no breach of the code. That has nothing to do with whether he's Jehovah or whether it can be impeached. He's the arbiter of the code. He says there's no breach. So there is no breach. That's the only point I'm making. Madam Speaker, the, the argument has gotten way too complex for me. The arbiter of the code sound almost like the lords of the rings, and that's not the discussion here. The discussion here is good, is good governance, Madam Speaker. Good governance is about good governance is about the public and the international community being able to rely on a cabinet decision. And, and when you have conflicting voices in the cabinet on a consistent basis, it begins to erode the credibility of the administration. So let me give, let me give a couple of quick examples, Madam Speaker. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Fox Hill. There is no conflict. There is no conflict within this cabinet. There is no conflict. That is a figment of your imagination. You brought up Mount Moriah last night. All right, it's a glad that you can tell. You brought up Mount Moriah last night. I mean, you can say what, whatever, whatever you wish to spin. That is political spin. That's fine. I accept that. All I'm saying is the statement that you made that there's been a breach of the code is inaccurate because the arbiter of the code said there was no breach. So there is no yes. breach. That's it. Sorry, Madam Speaker. My final point on this, and then uh, the member will have an opportunity to speak later. I, I recommend that he hold his seat until such time. But Madam Speaker, let me say this. The cabinet manual, the, the code, Madam Speaker, is one of those things that have been passed down from administration to administration. The present prime minister does not have any monopoly over this code. It transcends administration, continuity of government. So this business of him, him being able to speak a new thing, I know it's a new day you say, to speak a new thing, to do a new thing, a matter of it doesn't arise. They have, a, they have a problem. The problem is similar to when the member for Fort Charlotte, when the member for Fort Charlotte, Madam Speaker. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Fox Hill. There is no problem, there's no problem on this side except in the mind of the member for Marco City. There's no problem, there's no problem. And the rules are quite clear. Someone has to be the arbiter of the code. 
This is not the Privy Council. That's it's me. not. It's not the Supreme Court. The arbiter of the code is the Prime look Minister. Just like him. Look just like him. That's right. So the simple fact is, as a legal point, as a conventional point, whatever you want to say, whatever story you want to spin, the fact is, the arbiter of the code said there is no breach. breach. That's the end of that. Q E D. Honourable members. Honourable members. There's been no breach. Madam, Let's get back to the debate. Madam, Madam Speaker. Let's get, get on with the debate. If only bombing on the on the desk could make a false statement true. Madam Madam Speaker, let me let me let me move on, Madam Speaker. Let, do you recognize this gentleman member Fox Hill? Given permission to work as a physician? Do you remember that? And their prime minister said, I gave him permission, so no breach. What was the answer then? What's the answer then? He's your chairman. Ma Madam Speaker, uh, deflection is an incredible thing. And, uh, uh, <laughs> Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the reality is, <laughs> even Madam Speaker recognizes it. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we we implore, we implore, we celebrate successor, we salute him, we salute uh, Lady you, Lady Jesus. Leone Wallace. Yes, let's here. talk about that. We salute you for the sacrifice that you've made because the families of policymakers sacrifice alongside their spouses, and we thank God for uh, his fearlessness. Madam Madam Speaker, uh, just one final note on the R on the RCL uh, matter. Madam oh, Speaker, no. we'd like the Prime Minister to be consistent in opposition. He had a fundamental uh, uh, issue with it. He was embracing Bahamian entrepreneurs. The, the Bahamian entrepreneurs now feel as if they have been blindsided. Any deal we, I think they said, I think in the paper. Yeah, the, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Cat Island, Rumkin, San Salvador. You know, uh, the, the member obviously believe he has, he's having some good innings on this issue. But just the, the fact of the matter is, when I said, and if you look at all my utterances back then, I, I said I will cancel the deal because at that time the deal was conflicting with a Bahamian who had the same interests. That Bahamian or, or claimed to have the same, the same, the same interests. Is he attacking you this morning? Really? I didn't yeah, know that. Paper, yeah. uh, he claimed to have had the same interests. Yeah. <laughs> and if it comes to a foreigner and a Bahamian, I on the Bahamian side. And everyone who, anyone who knows me know that. Yeah. And at that time, I said, I, I, and, and the claim of the Bahamian was that he had gotten permission from the then administration to, to lease or this, this, this property, and then that the same administration turned around and leased the same property to, to RCL, blah, blah, blah. That was the position he prepared to re represented to me. After we, when we came into office, we met. And I was supporting him then too when we met on the premise that he had a signed lease. And then he said, he's gone to court. It's a court to determine whether it was in fact a lease. So the question is, why would you go to court to determine if you have a lease? Just produce the signed lease for me. Well, he said, he signed it, but the government hasn't signed it. Then I realized, well, something is wrong here. Something may be wrong here. So he said, so I said, do you have sufficient memoranda in writing to say that you have this? And he said, yes. So I said, well, okay, fine. Um, well, then your, your case should succeed if that is the case. But the memoranda he had was saying that subject to you signing the lease. And he had not, the government had signed the lease. That, so I allowed his case to go, go through. In the meantime, uh, RCL was continuing meeting with technical people trying to get the deal that we, they agreed that they're not going to huh? exclude, his land. E exclude the land that was in dispute and that if you consider it once they exclude the land. So consideration was given to what they were going to do excluding the land <clears throat> that overlapped with the land that Bahamian had owned, right? And, and that's, that's the basis on which the, the, the conversation continued, right? And so it's a different arrangement. First of all, the circumstances change. 
Eventually, the judge said, Mr. Smith, you have no, you have no, you have no you time. You didn't have an agreement for lease. You didn't have an agreement to lease. No. Right? He came and met me after the decision. And he indicated that you said you will support me. I said, yeah, I'll support you. Right? And I said, but you have no lease. Please resubmit your application so we can consider it. And so we, that's what we've been waiting for. He met with us, with his lawyer. And I'm still waiting. I don't know whether yet he has made that application, because it wouldn't reach me at that stage. But I invited him to resubmit for our consideration. Well, uh, well, <laughs> well I, maybe I must have, I must no, do that. Though. No, 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 I, no, I, I corrected, no, 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 I'm correcting, I'm correcting, so, 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 so I did not flip flop. <laughs> the, 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 what, what, the, the, what is under consideration now is, is a new arrangement altogether without the land that you were giving him. Just did. Okay. Mr. Thank you very much for uh, for sharing. Just, I think you you may have missed one or two details. Let me let me fill in at least one of them for you. So the the, the former administration, I'm advised, uh, signed gave a cabinet conclusion agreeing to the project. What was not done, according to the court records is there wasn't a signed lease. Most unfortunate, I don't know what the circumstances uh, were there, but it is most unfortunate. So let me, but let me say this. If there's a cabinet conclusion, if there's a ca cabinet, oh. The chair recognizes the honorable member Stop for the three front. down. Marco City says he does not know what the facts were. The facts were that they concluded to give a Bahamian land, refused to sign his lease, and then Marco City and his crew gave RCL the same land. He was in the cabinet. He's talking about collective responsibility. He should know. Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable I, Member. I was having a conversation with the Prime Minister. I'd like to continue. Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, <laughs> Ma Madam Speaker, the, the reality is with a cabinet conclusion, the, pri the Prime Minister is... The cabinet of the Bahamas have the authority, if it is minded to empower a Bahamian, having seen what they have submitted previously, one does not need to necessarily uh, submit once again. The prime minister, through those senior policy advisors, for, through the, the, um, the NEC, or through so actually BIA, can engage a Bahamian entrepreneur if they are minded to empower a Bahamian entrepreneur and negotiate what the arrangement would be versus asking them to submit all over again. So again, if we are minded to empower Bahamians, let's engage them. Let's meet with them on the margins of cabinet or BIA and have that and have a, and have a discussion. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Cat Island Rum Kings and Salvador. I'm just wondering if, if the member could just tell me what's the difference of what he said and what I said. I said, come back to the table. That's right. Right? Come Resubmit, and let's come back to the table and talk. Right. So, what's the difference? What's the difference? And that's what you're saying I should do? Well, well, I did what you say you should, I should do. So, what is the challenge? M Madam Speaker, what's what's the Madam challenge? Speaker, that's the way we decided to do it. We decided to, to ask him, look, tell us what you want. We said, that, 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 that's come back, come back to the table. Yes. And we'll consider it. Madam Speaker, part of our role in this, a part of our role in this place is to reflect the views of Bahamians so that all of us who work for Bahamians could respond to what their aspirations are. I'm not saying, the entrepreneur is saying, I feel betrayed. So when the Prime Minister asked the question, what is the difference between him asking the entrepreneur with whom he has met before to resubmit? It seemed to me that the entrepreneur is saying that in, in, you, in you asking me to start a process all over again is for me to then accept that the whole thing I've been working on all along has been nullified and I'm back to square one. And so there, so you ask me, you ask me to indicate what I perceive the difference to be. Yes. I've not read, I've not read what, I've not read what this, what, what, the, the, the agree, but I call him agree, 
the Hamer has said. I've not read it. Yes. If, if what you are saying is what he said, then he said he was betrayed. But I feel deeply disappointed and disturbed by his comments because I could call him and his lawyer, and if you talk, contact, contact his lawyer, right, his lawyer will tell you, they will tell you what I actually said to him. Yeah. I didn't tell him to throw away that which he had gone, done. I indicated to him, reapply, let's talk, and what you would have done will be taken into account. OK, no problem. Right? And, and, and if he's saying that, then I don't know what he wants me okay. to do now. Okay. If he's not, if he doesn't want to follow the process, there are a lot of others who now are looking and interested. Bahamians, too. Yeah. Right? So I, I'm disappointed and disturbed. I feel now betrayed by him. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. I, I look, I look forward, I look forward to to you doing what you've stated publicly, which is to continue to empower uh, Bahamians, uh, Prime Minister. It is our hope that what what we will see in whatever the arrangement is um, on Paradise Island, that there will be ongoing consultation with all stakeholders, that the concessions motorized and non-motorized water sports will all be uh, uh, Bahamian concessions, that the food uh, will be sourced from, from Bahamian farmers, fishers, that the, uh, um, the, all of the products from the artists and artisans will be uh, Bahamian. And so, Prime Minister, we, we, leave that, we leave that with you. We leave that with you, uh, Prime Minister, but I thought it appropriate to raise, to raise these issues. And so, so let me just say what has been stated earlier with respect to the Arbitration Amendment Bill 2023. Madam Speaker, this side, this side supports the continuation, and it's important to say, Madam Speaker, we support the continuation of the work that has been going on under successive administrations. Sometimes when you listen to members opposite, you would get the impression that the world has just been created. Everything has been fashioned over the last few years. It's, it's continuity in government, Madam Speaker. So this is a this is a draft, Madam Speaker, that this this sorry. No, I, I see them in 2026, Madam, Madam Speaker, and I, I'm grateful for their support in advance. So so Madam Madam Speaker, let me be let me be clear. This is a project that has been underway, Madam Speaker under successive administrations. Uh, you would recall the member, for, the former member for Yamacraw hired a consultant to look at putting and putting in place, Madam Speaker, a, a, a consultant who would focus on helping to develop the framework for alternative dispute resolution. And so the then Minister Johnson was again doing what this administration has now brought to the House, help in terms of are uh, putting in place much of the rubric with, with respect to alternative dispute resolution. The private sector, various stakeholders in the financial services community have been doing the heavy lifting over time. And both administrations have joined hands with those persons from the private sector to ensure that we shepherd uh, this piece of legislation through the system. And so I'm happy, we're happy to stand with the government. My colleagues um, will raise questions about particular uh, uh, amendments, but our view is the Bahamas is an ideal location uh, for to become one of the leading centers for arbitration. We have, Madam Speaker, uh, the personnel, the human resources. We are ideal in terms of our geopolitical position. We are strategically located off the off the case uh, off the coast of Florida. Um, we uh, again, Madam Speaker, are attractive as a as a jurisdiction, having the infrastructure and ecosystem in terms of modern telecommunication system, a court system or a jurisprudence that is recognized and valued and respected globally. We have all of the various elements of, of a jurisdiction that we believe makes us attractive to persons from around the world to come here and to address uh, conflicts or disputes they may have in trust and in other areas of, of, of our financial services. And so, Madam Speaker, we are pleased to, to support this with some questions that, in fact, my colleagues would, would raise. M Madam Speaker, one of the landmark cases that 
occurred in, in the Bahamas. Uh, there was a ruling, in, there was a case initiated in October 2016 that resulted in a ruling, a decision. It's the Wol the Wolpai uh, decision really sent a clear message to the international community that the Bahamas is open for business and that the, the arbitration clause inserted in, in trust uh, documents, trust agreements, when adjudicated in this or addressed in this particular environment does result in decision making that is uh, respected, that is valued, that is beneficial to those persons who are beneficiaries of, of these trust agreements. And that was a, a, a landmark decision that sent the right signal, not just domestically, but internationally. And so, Madam Speaker, we support the government in this regard. Let me, let me say this, Madam Speaker, as, as I wrap up. And I, I wrap up in a couple of parts, however, but let me say this. It's one thing for us to amend legislation with a view of improving our image, our reputation in financial services and in other areas of national life. But Madam Speaker, we can also undermine the reputation, good legislation, by the way in which we behave as an administration. I, I wish to caution the side uh, opposite, Madam Speaker. I want to give a couple of concrete examples of how we are making some unforced errors uh, that's costing this jurisdiction. Madam Speaker, I had, a chance, I had a chance to talk with uh, a few of my colleagues recently, and we looked at the, Madam Speaker, we looked at the, uh, the bonds and the way that they are trending on the international market. And so some persons raised concerns about the, the trends in, in the bond. We've raised this matter before in press releases. Uh, both myself and the member for East Grand Bahama have commented on, on the bonds. We applaud the government, Madam Speaker, for having, having in the past worked closely with Central Bank and, and, and the governor of the Central Bank, we applaud, Ma Madam Speaker, that they gave permission to Bahamians who can, in fact, purchase uh, bonds uh, in, in the United States. What a wonderful thing, Madam Speaker. We believe that our, our bonds, uh, are the instruments that we use to raise capital, that, that, that they're safe. We do get concerned sometimes when we believe that there is a loss of value even within a, within a particular period. But Madam Speaker, the bond market sometimes tell a story. We are not claiming to definitively know that full story. But what we are saying is that the government has to be concerned about inconsistencies in its statements because they have real life implications locally and internationally in the performance of our bonds, in how we are able to approach the international credit markets and what response we get from them. Uh, the credibility of what we say is so important, Madam Speaker, because it affects our rating as, as a country. People who are minded locally and internationally to invest in the Bahamas, they take cues from the things that are said by ministers in the government, by the fiscal strategy report released by the government, by not just the words, but the actions of the government. And we have some concerns. Madam Speaker, members, opposite, the members of the government jump up oftentimes when we are raising these questions, but yet they have not given compelling answers to questions we have raised about contradictions in their statements. RCL, we just spent probably 10 minutes discussing the difference of view between the member for Angliston and the deputy prime minister and the prime minister, Madam Speaker, they see the world differently on the RCL, on the Bahamian entrepreneur empowerment issue on Paradise Island. They have to clear that up. I'm gonna leave that, let them, but there is a difference. The public detects there's a difference. The media detects that there's a difference. And no amount of attempting to make the prime minister, the arbiter of the code, the phrase, is going to change the fact that everybody else but the New, new Day cabinet sees this issue differently. So, Madam, Madam Speaker, here, here, is, here, here are some other examples. Here are some other examples. Madam Speaker, protect me from the member for Fox Hill while I speak, Madam Speaker. It's, uh, Madam Speaker, there are other areas of contradictions 
in this administration. One, another example, Madam Speaker, was the BPL matter. We all sat here and listened to the member for Fort Charlotte, having denied no less than eight times that he and the Prime Minister had been briefed on the hedge and the benefit up to that point, 25 million, the potential benefit going forward, 55 million. Having denied, I count it at least eight times, one day he got an epiphany. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit that ministered him. But he then admitted that not only did he know, but the prime minister knew. And the prime minister made the decision. He said the minister of finance made the decision. We were not going to go with that deal. Madam Speaker, the result was a $100 million uh, uh, growth in terms of the, uh, sorry, we have some revisionist talking too loud, but Madam, Madam Speaker, it resulted in an increase in fuel charge and electricity the costs, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member for Freetown. In terms of revision, revision is happening across the way, Madam Speaker. The assertion was that the Ministry of Finance, which was then spun by the other side as the FS being more powerful, if one is going to speak, speak correctly. There is, and the record could be checked, the assertion that the Ministry of Finance did not do it. Thank you, Honorable Member. Untrue. He said ministry, he said minister as well. And we have, is, Madam Speaker, it's even on tape. It's on tape. So that, so that what the member says, uh, what he's attempting to do, Madam Speaker, unfortunately, is dead on arrival. It's untrue. So, Madam Speaker, there was a clear contradiction. Uh, the second, the, the third, the third example of conflict in statement and contradictory remarks, Madam Madam Speaker, it continues with this with this administration, Madam Speaker. We want we want members of the government in general, the Prime Minister in particular, to be extremely careful in public pronouncements because they have implications. Again, the Prime Minister, on, in his discussion of the deficit, was yet another example. Uh, Madam Speaker, of one day, the deficit is decreasing. Another day, the deficit is, incre is increasing. But we had a whole week in between to clarify the matter. And only when challenged did we get a correction on that issue. Madam Speaker, yes, words do matter, and so do actions. And so all of what the government says or fails to say relative to this economy in this global community has real life implications. Madam Speaker, the, the special drawing rights, we are looking forward, Madam Speaker, to getting the response from the Prime, from the Prime Minister. Uh, but Madam Speaker, we have reviewed the Central Bank's report. We've reviewed the previous statements made by the government on the special drawing rights. And Madam Speaker, that is the most troubling transaction that this government can engage in. It's one of the most troubling transactions. Madam Speaker, the government drew down, drew down on assets that were in the central bank's uh, remit, a part of their asset base, and the government never revealed that it was going to take possession in whole or in part of these funds, up to 232 million. We are hearing that all 232 million, Madam Speaker, has been, has, been, has been drawn down on. And so, Madam Speaker, we are deeply concerned that the credibility of our jurisdiction is impacted when these kinds of decisions are being made. And the government did so, in our view, in contravention of the Central Bank Act and must now come at a future date to, to make an amendment to cover the multitude of sins. Sorry, to cover the earlier decision that they made, Madam Speaker. And they're going to make that amendment retroactive to cover the decision to draw down on those funds. Never released a memorandum of understanding, Madam Speaker. Never revealed what the interest rate was, what the terms were, et cetera, Madam Speaker. Again, their words and action, they have to be careful of it because it sends a message to the international community. Madam Speaker, the, we raise concerns about the failure of the government to comply with the procurement law. I would not relitigate that issue because we spend a lot of time, Madam Speaker, discussing why the government refuses to reveal all of the contracts that they have entered into since coming to government. And Madam, Speak Madam Speaker, the response of this administration was, we don't intend to do so. We don't believe we are violating the law because we will change the law. 
And Madam Speaker, we know that it doesn't work that way. The law is the law. You comply with it, and when you change it, then of course you you have a right. You have a right then to adjust it if you believe it's cumbersome. Uh, you don't have the right software in place, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't have the luxury or the liberty to uh, abuse the law, break the law, and 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 then use as an explanation that you intend to change the law. Madam Speaker, you know how many, you know how many uh, different crimes Bahamians have committed, and they felt like uh, the thing that they were doing, the, 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 you know, the, the, the system is archaic in its thinking, and therefore uh, we know the law can change, but until it changes, we can do this thing. We can run that load. But we, uh, ma so, ma Madam Speaker, so this administration, this administration, through the violation of the Public Procurement Act, through the violation of the Public Management uh, and Finance Act, Madam Speaker, sends the wrong message to local and international creditors, rating agencies, investors about their true uh, intention and the wherewithal in managing this economy effectively. And so, Madam Speaker, again, we are very much concerned. As we move ahead, as a, as a wonderful international arbitration center, we say good legislation can be undermined by bad governance decisions. And so for an administration that is big, Madam Speaker, in talking about accountability and transparency, it is amazing to us how they have consistently violated a multiplicity of laws. Central Bank Act, the Public Finance Management Act, the Public Procurement Act, the Housing Act, illegally taking possession of $20 million, though even as a corporate soul, uh, the, the minister did not have the authority to borrow that money as was stated in here. So Madam Speaker, we challenge this administration to be consistent in what it says and what it does, and the understanding that it, it seeks to hold up to the, to the Bahamas and to the world, that they have to live by that standard as well. They are not exempt in this regard. And so as I as I close, as I close, Madam Speaker, I, I wish to say once again, Marco City in, in particular, uh, this side we support, we support the amendment, and we do have some questions that we wish uh, clarification on. But we say to the Bahamian people, hold this government to the same standard that every administration ought to be held to. They do not have the luxury of taking a private political trip using public funds, and never once lay the documents on the table. Madam Speaker, it is, in, it is, it is inappropriate. And so having, 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 said, having said that, Madam, Madam Speaker, Marco City rests. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Elizabeth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I join today as we celebrate the life of the father of our nation, Juan Salinden Pinlin, and wish him a happy heavenly birthday. My stories of him were shared to me through my grandmother, who enjoyed bragging about the type of leader that he came to be and watched him grow in his political career and watched the transformation of our country because of his leadership. And so I join as we celebrate his life, his accomplishments, and what he has done to make this day available to me. I also rise in this house to pay tribute to one of my stalwarts from the Elizabeth constituency, Ms. Patricia Mills, who stood strong for the PLP many times, made it clear was very unwavering and definitely carried out the message of what the Progressive Liberal Party was all about. And so I want to pay homage to her life and um, tell her family that they are in my thoughts and prayers. May her soul rest in peace. Since I... Members? Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker. Members, there's some yes. on the floor. There's some order. But, but, no. No, Madam Speaker. 
I also want to speak about some of the efforts that is continuously happening in the constituency to advance our ongoing initiatives. We are continuing with the pothole identification so that we could continue filling them. We know we've had a lot of rain, and so I've had a lot of constituents that's reached out to me, and we are continually working through the area to fill in our potholes. We also had a review by BPL. Members. <laughs> 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 Madam Speaker, we also had a review of our street lights. We had clearing down of bushes through uh, many of our corners. Risk and concerns was from our elderly, especially coming home in the evening when it's dark and having a lot of overgrown. So we've cleared down. We are continuing our green space program through the Fox Hill Road, um, the, the south side. I see the Fox Hill member looking at me, the south side that falls in my constituency. <laughs> and the formation of our Crime Watch Association, and we are also going through areas to make sure cleanliness is kept through Elizabeth. Constituency, Madam Speaker, education and support for literacy remains a key focus. In February, Jack and Jill of America, a leadership organization formed by African-American mothers to improve the quality of life for children, made a donation of $7,000 and over 200 books to the Thelma Gibson Primary School through their collaboration efforts with me and the Elizabeth Constituency Office. And I wish to publicly express my gratitude and thanks to Jack and Jill of America for the financial donation and the books will, which will expand the literacy offerings at the school. Madam Speaker, the Road Traffic <laughs> Department recently observed Road Safety Week under this theme, Slow Down, Stay Alive. Activities held during the week included the Road Safety Visibility Day, where wristbands and road safety information were distributed to motorists throughout the Bahamas, and the airing of a documentary, Safer Journeys, begins with us. A virtual road safety music rally on the radio station of the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas, and attendance of a church service at the Mount Tabor Church throughout the Bahamas, speaking on the importance of road safety. Our aim, Madam Speaker, is to change our behavior to road, road safety and reduce the number of traffic fatalities on our street. In short order, the ministry will launch Heads Up, Phones Down, a road safety outreach initiative for students and teens. The initiative will see the Ministry of Transport and Housing partner with schools, colleges, and youth organizations throughout the Bahamas to encourage road safety awareness. And I'm advised that road traffic represent representatives have already paid an outreach visit to the Huntley P. Christie High School in Andrus and the North Long Island High School in Long Island. As the Minister of Transport and Housing, I wish to publicly thank all partners and sponsors for their support in making Road Safety Week a huge success. Madam Speaker, as I rise to contribute to the debate on International Commercial Arbitration Bill and the Amendment to the Arbitration Act 2009 and Trustee Act, I wish to state from the onset that this member fully supports the efforts to modernize arbitration statute and regime in the Bahamas. The passage of the bill and the amendment will make the Bahamas more attractive as a center for international commercial arbitration. Arbitration, Madam Speaker, is a valuable method of settling disputes that may arise in the context of international commercial relationships. As a small island developing state, that is driven by a free market economy, the need to balance the efficiency of arbitral proceedings and the rights of the disputing parties to due process and fair treatment is vitally important to maintaining our nation's reputation and attractiveness of doing business. Madam Speaker, the International Commercial Arbitration Bill aims to streamline international commercial processes in the Bahamas. The proposed bill will deliver significant benefits for the Bahamian people including economic job growth, job creation, and improved business environment. The International Arbitration Bill will attract foreign investment by promoting the Bahamas as a premier international arbitration hub and encourage demand for local professionals such as lawyers, arbitrators, and other support staff. 
The bill will also provide an efficient dispute resolution system, encouraging the growth of local businesses engaged in international trade and enhance the credibility and reputation of the legal system for benefit of all of Bahamians. Madam Speaker, the proposed bill aligns with the Bahamas with global best practices in international commercial arbitration, making the country more competitive on the world stage. The bill will also save time and resources for Bahamian businesses involved in international transactions. Of significant importance, Madam Speaker, is that the International Commercial Arbitration Bill will ensure fairness, transparency, and impartiality in the arbitration process, protecting the rights and interests of Bahamian businesses and individuals. Madam Speaker, some of the key general provisions of the International Commercial Arbitration Bill include Clause 3, limit on the scope of application of the bill to international commercial arbitration agreements between the Bahamas and other states. Clause 7, limit court intervention to specific circumstances outlined in the bill. Clause 8, designate the permanent court of arbitration as the authority for certain functions of arbitration assistance and supervision. Clause 12 through 18 provide guidance on the number of arbitrators, appointment procedures, grounds for challenges, and the arbitral tribunal's ability to rule on its own jurisdiction. And Clause 30 through 41 ensure equal treatment of all parties, determine rules of procedures, set the place and commencement of arbitration, outline language determination, and address confidentiality. These key provisions, Madam Speaker, underpins the International Commercial Arbitration Bill in providing a comprehensive framework for the processes, the composition of tribunals, the conduct of proceedings, and the enforcement of awards. By establishing clear guidance and rules, the bill aims to facilitate efficient, transparent, and fair arbitration processes for international commercial dispute, disputes involving the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, the amendment to the Arbitration Act 2009 and Trustee Act seeks to include provisions related to the resolution of trust disputes through arbitration. It also expands and replaces the existing arbitration of trust disputes provisions in the Trustee Act and seeks to refine the Arbitration Act by expanding the interpretation section, clarifying the scope of application, defining mandatory and non-mandatory provisions, providing for the improper disclosure of confidential information, and outlining the provisions relating to challenge and appeal of the award. The amendment, Madam Speaker, promotes the efficient and cost-effective resolution of trust disputes, provides a secure and confidential environment for resolving trust disputes, and demonstrates the government's commitment to modernizing the legal framework and fostering a business-friendly environment. Madam Speaker, some of the key general provisions of the amendment include the following. The inclusion of provisions related to the resolution of trust disputes through arbitration, expansion and replacement of existing arbitration of trust disputes provision affected by the Trustee Act Amendment 2011, the expansion of the interpretation section of the Arbitration Act 2009, clarification of the scope of application of the Arbitration Act, an outline of provisions relating to challenge and appeal of the award in the Arbitration Act 2009. The bill, Madam Speaker, represents a significant step forward for the Bahamas in trust dispute resolution. It provides an efficient, cost-effective, and confidential means of resolving trust disputes. The amendments will strengthen the Bahamas' international reputation as a reliable and trustworthy jurisdiction for trust and dispute resolution. Madam Speaker, all of these amendments and the related legislation that we are passing today are a positive step for this government towards supporting various sectors in our country and the growth of our international partnerships. Specifically for the maritime sector, us passing recently the Merchant Shipping Act, this new legislation, the International Arbitration Committee, Commi Committee Act, will uh, support us in our registry 
and entry requirements, many of which international companies look for how they would be, be able to affect arbitration in the event there is a dispute. And so I fully support the government's move to bring this legislation and to make the relevant amendments to the act. And I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many. All right, Madam, Madam Speaker. This is the best speaker in this beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you blackmailing me in on live TV, man. Madam Speaker. <laughs> you white mailing uh, me? Okay. Madam Speaker. <laughs> Chair recognizes the honorable member for West Grand Bahama and Bimini. Madam Speaker, I now move the House suspends for the lunch break. We return to 3 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you, honorable member. Is there a seconder? Second. Thank you, honorable members. It has been moved and seconded that the business of this House be suspended until 3 p.m. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The motion of the, is agreed. The business of this House is now suspended until 3 p.m. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs>